you would open with me, please, um, the hour is late and I'm young. <laughs> so let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28 verses uh, 18 through 20. We'll begin there and we'll be turning the scriptures and trying to get as much as we can in the time that we have. We probably, but we never do anyway. We probably won't get through the whole message or I'll condense it as much as I can. But I don't want to rush it so much that you lose the importance of it. I believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And, and so we have to teach then teach again then teach again, then teach again, because the word uh, in the Greek where it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, it, it means a continuous action of hearing. Now, people don't always get things the first time. Sometimes they don't get it the second time, the third time. Sometimes not the fourth or fifth time. Sometimes it's the tenth time. And you just got to keep at it and keep hearing the word of God. And what I want to do before we read the text and, and expound on the passages that we're going to open to today so I want to posit three questions to you because I believe that if you, if, you, if you answer these three questions rightly, you will understand everything you need to about the subject of water baptism. Number one question is this, and we'll address that first, is uh, who did Jesus command us to baptize? Who did Jesus command us to baptize? That's question number one. The second question is this, what was the New Testament pattern, or what was the pattern and practice of the early church in the book of Acts? What, what pattern did they follow? What practice did they have? And as we look at that, you're going to see that their pattern and practice followed the command of Christ to the T, to the letter. The third question is this, is what is the meaning of baptism? What does it mean? So if you can understand the meaning of baptism, uh, you'll understand for whom it applies. So let's answer those three questions uh, as best as we can. Uh, verse 18, are you ready? And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here's the question, who is the them that Jesus commands to be baptized? The disciples, right? Uh, the understood subject is the disciples go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, them who? Them disciples. And whatever you want to believe about these disciples, it is clear from the text that in making these disciples, two things are being done. Number one, they're being baptized. But number two, they're being taught. Whoever these disciples are, they are mature enough to be able to be taught all things that the Lord has commanded us. Therefore, there is a level of maturity in, in age that they must have attained to to be able to teach them all things, to observe all things that the Lord has commanded us. The second scripture we're going to look at is Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Again, I told you we're going to try to move quickly as we can because of the time. So Jesus commands in Matthew 28 that disciples be baptized. And those same disciples are of age that they're able to understand the teachings of Christ uh, to the point that they're able to observe all things that the Lord commanded us. We'll go to Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. And hear these words again from the lips of Jesus. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So in this passage, who does Jesus command should be baptized? Believers, right? Those who hear 
those who believe are then to be baptized. In fact, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I'm just going to throw it out there in case we don't get to it later. In Acts 18, verse 8, you don't have to turn there. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. So his entire household believed, just like Crispus. And many of the Corinthians, hear these words, hearing, <coughs> believed, and were baptized. Hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now where did they get that from? Well, they got it from Jesus that said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes, that person that believes, is then to be baptized. So it is clear from Scripture, from the commands of Jesus, that those who are to be baptized are people that are disciples of Christ, capable of being taught. Capable of, of observing all things that the Lord commanded us they are people that are able to hear, understand, comprehend, believe they are to be baptized. Now, there's something else I want to throw out here uh, because it's a, this, is, this passage and another one uh, cause a, a great degree of confusion among people. And I just want to throw this out there in case anybody has heard false teaching uh, about this. I, I want this to be put out there for you. It, it should bless your socks off if you're wearing socks. If you're not, put some on and it'll bless them right off. Okay. <laughs> it says, uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So what happens is people look at this and they say then, in order for you to be saved, you have to what? Be baptized, right? And then you run into the confusion of there's a myriad of scriptures that teach that we are truly saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works that we do. So now if you add baptism to that, now you're dealing with a work that is being done, and now you're saying works save us. Or what happens even among infant baptizers is they make something magical about the water that somehow the water washes away sin. No such scripture teaches that. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that remits and removes our sin, not the water. The water is purely symbolic just as the elements of communion, the, the bread and the wine, are symbolic representing the body and blood of Christ. The water is representative. It's not actually doing anything. Okay? So what does he mean here? And, and this is going to help you. I mean, this is going to bless you so much. Like I said, if you're wearing socks, it's going to bless them right off. I want to remind you of a, a uh, message that we did earlier this year. Uh, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was definitely this year. Um, and I'm just going to read the text because I think in reading the text, it will jog your memory and cause you to recall some of the things that we said. Okay? So just listen to me. Matthew chapter 12, and then I'll, I'll help you to understand what Jesus is saying. In Matthew 12, verse 33 through 37, it says these words. This is Jesus speaking. Either make the tree good and the fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Remember we taught this before that... Um, you know, also Matthew chapter 7, I think it's verse uh, seven, 17 and 18, Jesus says, Good trees bear good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit, good trees don't bear bad fruit, bad trees don't bear good fruit, right? Uh, you, you, you know a tree by the fruit, right? You know it's an apple tree, why? It's got apples. You don't get to call yourself an apple tree and you don't have apples. You don't get to call yourself a good tree and you don't have any good fruit. You don't get to say you're a Christian and bear nothing but bad fruit in your life. You don't get to say you're a Christian 
and your words are, in other words, he's using the words, you're justified by your words, by your words you'll be condemned. He's looking at the fruit, the evidence of the person to indicate the nature of the person. Good words, good heart, bad words, bad heart. Good tree, or good fruit, good tree, bad fruit, bad tree, right? And so what he is simply teaching us in Mark chapter 16 is this, that if a person, let me back up just a moment. Let me bring another scripture to bear. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then he goes on to the next verse. Okay, everybody agrees we're all saved by grace through faith apart from works. That is the gospel message. That's the gospel truth. Absolutely 100%. Amen. If you don't believe that, you're not saved. However, he goes on from there. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus on the good works. In other words, if you believe you're his workmanship and now is his workmanship coming from that faith is going to proceed good works. Not good works unto salvation, but good works flowing from faith, flowing from belief. So what Jesus is simply saying here is this. If a person claims to believe in Christ, but they will not obey Him in the waters of baptism, then perhaps they don't really believe. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Because if you believe, what is the, what is the necessary uh, component of that belief? Faith without works is dead. Faith without uh, corresponding actions is unprofitable. It's unfruitful. Uh, if a person believes, that person that believes, if they have a repentant heart, it should show forth in the works that they do, so therefore they should obey the Lord in baptism. That's what Jesus is teaching. He's not saying there's something magical about the water, that somehow the water is washing away your sins, or somehow there's a formula involved that baptism will save you. He's simply saying, if you really believe, obey me. Right? Don't, right? Remember Jesus said this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? Isn't that fair? Don't call me Lord and you're not going to listen to a word I have to say. Right? <laughs> yeah. With Lord, and then we're stubborn and hard-headed and just beating against everything the Lord says. It doesn't work that way, folks. Uh, we're to be like little children, right? Dependent, meek, submissive, obedient. So let us now, with the time that we have remaining, let's go to the book of Acts. We see the command of Christ. The command of Christ is clear. We see the fact that faith precedes baptism. Baptism does not precede faith. Now we go to the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, um, let's see the New Testament, or the pattern, I should say, the practice of the New Testament church as they carry out this command. Let's see if there's any parallel. Or do they change it? Do they all of a sudden reverse the order? Right? Infant baptism would have us to believe that we are to baptize people first. Then have them here in hopes that they will one day believe. Is that what Jesus commanded? Well, nobody wants to give me the answer. The answer is no. Otherwise, he would have said, go into all the world and baptize people first. Then they can hear, and then hopefully one day they will believe. But baptism doesn't even, baptism doesn't even mean that. Baptism simply means that it, it is symbolic or representative of an inward work. It's an outward display of an inward work. Something, a present reality of faith. That in that person's heart, there is real living faith. Not hopes that there will be faith, but that there is faith. So let's go to Acts chapter 2. And beginning in verse 36, this is the, uh, this is the first record of baptism being conducted after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. This is the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. Jesus has ascended to heaven already. The disciples are in the upper room waiting for the outpouring of
of the Holy Spirit, and how the Holy Spirit is poured out, Peter stands up, he preaches to all the people that are assembled at the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Now listen to this, okay, very important. Don't miss any of this. I'm trying to help people that are on the fence, that they're, they're not really quite sure where they stand on this subject. Some know where they stand. Others, others are confused or not sure where they stand. So I just want you to see, and, and I want you to see I'm not making any of this up. We, we looked at the commands of Christ, the, right? The commands of Christ are explicit, they're clear. It's not, um, it's not up for debate or up for discussion as to what he said. Uh, there, there's no confusion about what he said. There's no confusion about what he commanded. It's not an argument of silence as some say. Jesus did tell us who to baptize. That is a fact. But we're going to see it carried out in the early church, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel... So who's Peter speaking to? The house of who? Israel. Speaking to Israel, this is important, right? They're all assembled for the Feast of Pentecost. Know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now think about this is again 50 days after the Passover. Seven weeks. And Peter saying, You crucified your Messiah. And they're cut to the heart. And huh, what are we going to do? Uh, we just put to death our Messiah to kill them. Then Peter said to them, be baptized and repent. No, he didn't say that. He said, he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized. Repent first, be baptized second. Not be baptized first, repent second. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, or the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, question, what is the promise he's referring to? Verse 38, right? Verse 38, the promise is the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you were to back up to verse 33, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Notice the promise of the who? Holy Spirit. So the promise is not baptism. The promise we refer to is forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? That's what has drawn this crowd around them on Pentecost is because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He says this is the promise. It's to you and your children. Question, who is the you and your children? Who is he speaking to again in verse number 36? The house of who? Israel. Israel. So who's the you and your children? Israel. Israelites and their descendants after them, right? This is not, this is what the covenant theologians want us to believe. He's not saying you and your children as in a covenantal family that... Um, the, the, the promise of baptism is to you and your children. No, the promise is not baptism. The promise is the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's explicitly stated. In fact, if we were to go back, I believe it's to uh, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it's referred to as the promise of the Father. Uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, that is. The promise of the Father. Uh, so the promise is not baptism. It's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit. It's remission of sins. And the you and your children is not, uh, you know, in a household per se, the you and your children is to Israel and Israel the descendants of, of them. And then he goes on from there, he doesn't stop, and to all who are afar off. Who would the all who are afar off be? He's already talked about Israel, right? The all who are afar off would be the Gentiles, everybody else. Gentiles just means the nations, right? So, hey, it's to you and your children, Israel. And it, it's to all who are far off. And then he qualifies it. Listen to the qualifier. Don't miss this. Essential. As many as the Lord our God will call. So he defines this group of people even narrower. He says it's not just you and your children and all who are far off, the Gentiles. 
It is as many as the Lord our God will call. So now in view is God's electing grace. It is, it is everybody in Israel and everybody outside of Israel that the Lord has called unto salvation that the promise of the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit is true. It's not just for anybody and everybody and everybody's going to be saved. No, it's to those whom the Lord has called unto salvation. So the, the application here now is, hey, this group is defined. All of you and your children that are called by God to salvation and all of you Gentiles who are called by God unto salvation, this promise is to you. You get excited about it. He goes on from there, and it says, And with many other words, uh, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Question, who were the those who that were baptized? Believers. Right, those who received the word that day, right? Those who received the word that day were those who were baptized. Not everybody was baptized. Those who received the word. And we can know from that that those who received the word were those who the Lord had called unto salvation. Acts chapter 8. And I can see there is no way in the world that we're going to finish this. So we're going to just take up uh, this passage, I think, and um, we might call it a wrap. We're going to look at two passages in Acts chapter 8. Um, just for sake of time, this is Philip preaching uh, the gospel in Samaria. And uh, if you were to read verse 5 and 6, it says that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So we see multitudes of people heeding the preaching of Philip. Multitudes of people, I don't know about you, but multitudes in my mind, you're talking hundreds of people, perhaps thousands of people, like on the day of Pentecost. You get down to verse 12, still the same text, still, still the same context. What does it say? But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. When were they baptized? After they believed, right? I'm, I'm just reading the scripture to you. I'm not adding anything to it. They heard Philip, they believed Philip, and then they were what? Baptized. Notice what is excluded from the text. Children. Who said that? Fabulous. Never, you got to move here, okay? Robert, you guys got to move here. <laughs> Children are excluded from the text. Nothing. You're going to tell me there's multitudes of people, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people, and there's no children baptized? That's exactly what I told you. You know why I said it? Acts 8 verse 12 says men and women. The absence of the... There's nothing about children. Why? Why would there not be infants included? What, what's the command of Christ? Believe. To be a disciple, to be of age that you can be taught to observe all things that the Lord commanded. So it's, it's inapplicable to anyone else who is not of age to be able to believe. Who's not of age to be a disciple. A disciple is a learner. How can you be a learner if you can't even understand words? You go on in Acts chapter 8. I'm going I'm to bypass this next one in Acts chapter 8. I'll use it at the lake front uh, when we go there. Um, that, that buys me a little bit of time. A little bit of time. Let's go to Acts 16. Because I know that the biggest stumbling block, I think, I think, not for everybody, but, but the biggest stumbling block is household baptisms. You always hear household baptism, household baptism, household baptisms. Well, let me, let, let's look at we actually skipped the, the 
first household baptism, which is Peter at Cornelius' house. He preaches the gospel at Cornelius' house. Everybody is hearing the gospel, and, and, the, and, and the Holy Spirit interrupts Peter's preaching. And the Holy Spirit falls upon the household. And they all begin to speak with tongues and magnify God. And you know what they say about it? This, this way I don't have to go through the whole text, but you can look it up later. You know what they say about it? You can read it. It starts, if you start in verse 43 of Acts 10 through verse 48. He says in verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then they baptize them. Now, now think this is a precedent setting to them. This is the first household. The whole household heard. The Holy Spirit falls on the entire household. Question. Can you receive the Holy Spirit and not believe? No. So they heard. The Holy Spirit falls upon them. Now hear the words of Peter. Can anyone forbid water to these who have received the Holy Spirit as we have? What's the indication? The indication is, if they had not received the Holy Spirit, they would have forbidden water. But because they have received the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's presence is evidence of, the, of salvation in their life. And because of that evidence, they give the waters of baptism. Otherwise, they would have forbidden baptism. So we go to Acts 16. You ready? This is the last passage. We're going to have to close this up. I apologize. Acts 16, this is, this is uh, one of those household baptisms, and I just want you to see very clearly, okay? Again, I'm not making any of this up. You can read it all in the text. What very often happens here in Acts 16 is people read verse 30 and 31, and they stop. They stop. And they form their teaching on verse 30 and 31 without reading the, the rest of the text, and they miss the whole point. Okay? Notice this, and I promise this is the last text. And he brought them out and said, this is uh, uh, Paul and Silas had been uh, in prison for preaching the gospel. And uh, the Lord sends an earthquake. Everyone's bands are loose. The prison doors are open. They get outside. The Philippian jailer is going to harm himself, kill himself. And uh, they say, don't do any harm to yourself. We're here. And uh, verse 30, this is the Philippian jailer speaking to Paul and Silas. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now stop right there because that's where most people stop. And they'll say, well see, he believed. And it seems like in verse 31 when you read it that just because the Philippian jailer believed that the entire household was then saved. But is that what we know about salvation? Isn't salvation, we've talked about this before, salvation is not hereditary. See, that's, that's applying uh, old covenant principles to the new covenant, meaning this, that in the old covenant, the old covenant was hereditary. You were born into it by being a descendant of Abraham. You were a descendant of Abraham, you were in the old covenant. But in the new covenant, the only people in the new covenant are people that know the Lord is saving them. Hebrews chapter 8 teaches them. It is a fully regenerate, born-again, believing membership in the new covenant. The old covenant was a natural covenant, not a spiritual covenant. And uh, so if you were born into it, you, you were part of the covenant. But in the new covenant, you have to be born again into it. <laughs> You've got to be regenerated into, born again into the new covenant. But anyway... Uh, you don't want to start implying that, you know, because Steve believes in Jesus, that automatically his whole household is saved. You, you don't want to do that because uh, if you confess with your mouth, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. Singular, singular, singular. You've got to believe. Now watch this, verse 32. Are you ready? And then we're going to close. Verses 32 through 34. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to what? All who were in his house. How, how many people in his house heard? Every one of them. 
Verse 33, and he took them the same hour of the night and lost their stripes, and immediately he and what? All. All his family were baptized. Go on to verse 34. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. All, 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 all heard, all believed, therefore all were baptized. Again, where did they get that pattern from? They got it from Jesus. Preach the gospel. Those that believe it are to be baptized. Hearing, believing, baptized. That's why we do the things that we do now or the way that we do it now. It is following the commands of Christ. It is following the, the pattern of the New Testament church throughout the book of Acts. We could go to every single solitary passage that shows an individual being baptized. And we can explicitly show you from the text the same thing applies across the board. If you believe anything else other than that, you have to inject it into the text. It's not there. So with that, uh, we didn't have time to talk about the meaning of baptism. At least we got two out of three. That's not bad. Okay? So let's pray and uh, continue on with our worshipful day. Father, we, we so love you and bless you. We're thankful that your word is clear. It's not muddled. It takes theologians to come along and confuse us. Uh, if we just gave everyone a New Testament and asked them to come to their conclusions about baptism by reading the New Testament... We'd all come to the same conclusions, but uh, the intellectuals, the uh, people that have an interpretive grid that they impose upon the text bring much confusion and turmoil to all of our hearts at different times. But we're glad that, uh, that we can repent of metanoia, change the mind. We can have our minds renewed. We can have our minds changed. We can turn, and there's no shame in that. That's, there's blessing in repentance. There's blessing in turning. There's blessing in having our minds renewed and thinking a different way. It's okay to have practiced one thing before, and then the light of the Word shines upon the heart and the mind, and we turn uh, toward you. Lord, be merciful and gracious to us, I pray, and as we uh, dismiss in just a moment from this service, we pray for uh, your Spirit to... To make this day special and meaningful for those that enter the water to be baptized because they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because they can volitionally obey of their own will of the command of Christ to be baptized. And in so doing, the water represents their death to the old life of sin and resurrection into a new life in Christ where we are indeed dead to sin and alive to God. And that is what water baptism represents. And we pray, Lord, for this to be a meaningful day for all those involved, even those that just watch, attend. Lord, visit us with your presence, moved by your Spirit, according to thy grace and favor. In the Lord's name we pray. Amen.